Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night study in the book of Acts. We're at Christian Family Church of Santa Maria, California. And if you'd like to see more of our messages, you can go to YouTube. And if you type in the search engine, this one word, starting with a capital C, Christian Family 324, you'll be able to pull up all of our sermons. If you'd like to go to our website, you can find our website at www forward slash cfcsm.org. Those initials stand for Christian Family Church Santa Maria. And if you'll just go to the top of the, any page in our website, it says go to our sermons. You'll find the line there. If you'll click it, all of our sermons on YouTube will pop up there as well. Thank you for joining us. And I would like to make an announcement before we continue here. Today is uh, September 30th, Wednesday evening, and we're going to be opening up our church on Sunday morning, October 4th. Uh, Santa Barbara County has announced that we are now in a red tier position in our state. We're able to open up uh, our church for uh, open door services. So we'd like to invite each one of you uh, to come out and join us for service this coming Sunday morning at uh, 10 o'clock a.m. Also, we have a Sunday evening service, which we will also be open for, and that's on every Sunday evening at 6 o'clock p.m. Currently, we're studying the book of Revelation. We also have a Monday night prayer, which starts at 7 o'clock p.m. here in the sanctuary. So you're welcome to attend those, and we would appreciate it if, if you would be faithful to the Lord and pray about attending those services. God bless you. Before we start... I'd like to ask you to join me in prayer. Father, thank you for the time we can spend here. We are so grateful, Lord, to be able to open the building back up where we can meet and worship you. We thank you and praise you for your goodness to us. And Lord, as we study uh, the book of Acts chapter 27, I pray that you will bless us with information and wisdom that we can use in this day and age in our lives. So, Father, speak to us and teach us, I pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our guide. We ask you to bless this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 27, regarding Paul's voyage to Rome. Uh, I want to start in verse 21, because Paul had warned the, the uh, master of the ship that they were traveling in that there would be a terrible storm and that the ship would suffer loss and be broken up. And uh, the master didn't believe him. He believed some others who were on the ship instead. And certainly enough, the storm came. And uh, as we'll study today, the storm came. And there was great loss, not only of material goods, uh, but also the, the men were in peril themselves. So as we start in verse 21, we're going to read down through verses 25 and then uh, go forward from there. The scripture says, After a long time, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have listened to me and have not loosed from Crete to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but you will lose the ship. Verse 23. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God has given you all of those who are sailing with you. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told unto me. So Paul says, in essence, I told you so. And you know, oftentimes we do get instruction. We get it from biblical teachings. We get it from the Word of God. And sometimes we get it from other believers, uh, even our parents. And oftentimes we don't heed the instruction. So I'd like to take a look at Proverbs chapter 27, the book of Proverbs in the middle of your Bible. Proverbs in the 27th proverb. I'd like to read verses 5 and six. The Bible says open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. 
There are times that we are told things that maybe is even comfortable for us to hear. But God often speaks things that are hard to hear. But we, if we take heed, we will be in safety. If we don't take heed, then as Paul and his companions, they suffered peril on the sea. Proverbs chapter 8, if you'll just turn to your left there. Proverbs, the 8th chapter. And starting with verse 10, the Bible says, Receive my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. So in verses 22 through 25, the Apostle Paul encourages the men in the ship, and he prophesies for their safety. So, as we read, an angel met with the Apostle Paul the evening before and spoke to him, encouraging him and telling him, yes, the ship will be lost, but there'll be no lives that will be lost. So let's take a look at Psalm 91, how that applies to us in today's climate. Psalm 91, verses 9 through 12, the scripture says, Because you have made the Lord which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation or your dwelling place. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For God will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. They will bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the adder and the young lion and the dragon, you will trample under feet. And because you have set, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him, says the Lord. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Praise God. Knowing the Lord is the most important thing we can do in this life. Let's take a look at the book of Joel. So if you go all the way to the end of the major prophets, Daniel, and then you'll go, get to Hosea and then Joel, the book of Joel, right after the book of Daniel and Hosea. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. The scripture says that it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men will dream dreams, and your young men shall have visions. So yes, prophesying, things that God tells us to speak, it really means speaking forth the truth of God. So when we prophesy, we speak forth the truth of the living God. And then turn back with me before the book of Psalms to the book of Job. And in the book of Job chapter 22 and verse 28, Job 22 and 28, the scripture says, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it will be established for you, and the light will shine upon your ways. So God says if we decree something in faith, it'll be established for us, and the light will shine upon our ways. In other words, God will show us which way to go. You know, the Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. Jeremiah chapter 23, closing out that thought, the book of Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, and verse 28. The Bible says, let the prophet that has a dream, let him tell his dream. And let him who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. For what is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? So if God has given you a word, speak the word and be faithful to speak his word, as Paul did to his shipmates. So let's go back to Acts chapter 27. We're going to read verses 26 through 29. Paul goes on to tell them, we must be cast upon a certain island. So apparently this angel who spoke with Paul also showed him in the spirit that they were the ship would be grounded on a certain island. So when the 14th night was come, can you imagine 14 nights in the sea being tossed to and fro? I think we can imagine some of that. Some of us have been tossed to and fro for the last several months since March of 2020. 
So being tossed to and fro doesn't necessarily mean our destruction. It necessarily means that we're being tossed to and fro. So the sailors try to save the ship anyway. Let's take a look here. In the 14th night, we were driven up and down in Adria. About midnight, the shipmen uh, surmised that they drew near to some country. And they, they sounded and found it 20 fathoms deep. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms deep. Then fearing that we should have fallen upon the rocks, they cast out four anchors out of the stern and hoped that daytime would come soon. So in verses 26 through 29, the sailors tried to save the ship anyway, even though the Apostle Paul has told them, you're going to lose the ship. You're going to lose all the things that are in the ship, but no lives will be lost. Let's take a look at Psalm 108. Psalm 108, if you'll turn there with me. Psalm 108, starting with verse 12. The Psalm 108, verse 12 says, Lord, give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Boy, that speaks a mouthful, doesn't it? God is our only help. He is our only refuge. He is our strength and a very present help in times of trouble, Psalm 46, 1 tells us. So God, help us from trouble, for vain is the help of man. To look to men to deliver us in a time of trouble is foolish. To look to God is the only refuge we have. He is our habitation. He's our high tower and our stronghold. So in verse 13, the scripture says, through God, we will do valiantly, for it is he that treads down our enemies. And we really have to understand that it's only God that lifts one up and brings down another. It's only God who can truly protect us. And then in Jeremiah, that thought is echoed by the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 17. And we're going to start with verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Jeremiah 17, 5. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm, whose heart departs from the Lord. There's a teaching here in verse 5. When we put our trust in men and in flesh, our heart departs from the Lord. Jesus put it this way. You can't serve two masters. You will either love the one and hold to the other, despise the one and, and, and hold on to the other. You can't serve two masters. We either serve the Lord or we please people. You can't do both. So again, cursed is the man who puts his trust in a man and makes flesh his arm for whose heart will depart from the Lord. For he will be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good comes but will inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land that is not inhabited. But blessed is the man, verse 7, who trusts in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. For he will be like a tree planted by the waters that spreads out her roots by the river and shall not see when the heat comes. But her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Two choices here in these scriptures, in Jeremiah 17. Trust in man, your heart departs from the Lord, or trust in the Lord and bear fruit for God. Praise the Lord. Paul trusted in the Lord. In verses 30 and 31, back in Acts chapter 27, verse 30 and 31, the Bible says as the shipmen were about to run or flee out of the ship, abandon ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under the color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these shipmates stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. You see, that's one of the things we have to understand about how this scripture would speak to us in these terrific times that we're going through in our country. 
unless we stay in the ship, stay in the boat. Remember, the sea is churning. The waves are, are, are reaching heights that we've never seen before. The winds are blowing. There's a great tempest. But unless we stay in the ship, and of course we know the ship is Jesus Christ, we are a ship in the sea. We just don't want the sea to get in the ship. We want to stay in the ship and keep the sea out of the ship. Amen? And this is what Paul is telling. He's warned the sailors to stay in the ship. And he said, unless we stay in the ship, we'll drown. And particularly in our case, unless we stay in the ship, we'll drown in the world's trouble. There's plenty of trouble out there for us to drown into. We need to stay anchored and focused in the ship. The Bible says in Isaiah 26.3, Thou, O God, will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. The only peace we're going to have, especially during times of trouble, is keeping our eyes and our ears attuned to the author and the finisher of our life. Let's take a look at Philippians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul gives great counsel to the church in Philippi. Philippians chapter 4. Verses 6 through 9. Paul says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep or guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, well, that leaves the fake news media out now, doesn't it? Whatever things are true, Whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, and whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and there's any praise, then think upon these things. What things? The things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report. Then we want to take a look at Psalm 46. Back into the middle of your Bible, Psalms, the book of Psalms, and Psalm 46. So what do we do in the midst of trouble? Plenty of it in our country now. What do we do? Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge. He's our hiding place. He's our strength. And he's a very present help in time of trouble. The Bible goes on to say, therefore... We will not fear, even if the earth be removed. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, even though the waters thereof roar and are troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, because there is a river, and that river is the water of life, Jesus Christ. Both living word of God, the Lord Jesus, and written word of God, the Bible. There is a river the streams which will make glad the city of God, which is the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. And then God describes his body, the church, the bride of Christ. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her, and that right early. The Bible goes on to say the heathen raged. Yes, they did, and yes, they are. The kingdoms were moved, and then God utters his voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our hiding place, our refuge. Come and behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he has made in the earth. He makes wars to cease even unto the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in half, and he burns the chariot in the fire. Those are all weapons used against uh, those who are attacking. They're used against us. But God says he breaks all the weapons, cuts the spear in half, and burns the chariot in the fire. So then he tells us, be still. Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen, and I will be exalted in the earth. For the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Then let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 6. The book of Hebrews right before the book of James in your uh, New Testament, Hebrews, chapter 6, 
We're going to start with verse 17. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show to the heirs of promise the immobility of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. In other words, in order to mutate something, you have to destroy it. God says his counsel is immutable. It can't be changed. It can't be harmed. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says that by two unchangeable or immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that's set before us. We need to flee to Jesus, run into his arms during this time especially, because we have him as a hope and the anchor of our soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters into that within the veil. In other words, Jesus has entered into the holy of holies. He's our anchor. He intercedes for us, the book of Romans chapter 8 tells us. He's got us covered. And then let's take a look at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 3. God talks about the different kinds of ground that we let his word or his seeds fall upon. We're going to go Mark chapter 4, verses 3 through 20. Jesus said, listen, or hearken. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. And the birds of the air came and devoured them up. Now some fell on stony ground where it didn't have much earth, and immediately it sprang up, but because it had no depth of earth, when the sun came up, it was scorched. Because it had no root, it withered away. Verse 7 says, Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit at all. Other, however, fell on good ground, and it yielded fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, and some a hundredfold. And then he said to them, He that hath ears, let him hear. And when he was done, that they were about him of, with the twelve, asked him about the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto those who are outside, all these things are done in parables. That seeing they may see, but not understand, and hearing they may hear and not understand. Lest at any time they would be converted and their sins would be forgiven them. And then he said to them, Don't you know this parable? How then will you know all the parables? Verse 14, The sower sows the word, and these are they by the wayside where the, world, where the word is sown, but when they heard it, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that was planted in their heart. That's why Jesus said, let him who has an ear. He's not talking about this ear. He's talking about the ear of our heart. He that has a heart to hear, let him hear. Verse 16 says, and these are likewise those who are sown on stony ground, who when they heard the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. But they have no root in themselves. And so they stay for a little while, and afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they're offended. I've met several like that in my Christianity over the last 40 years, where they come into the church and become a part of the church, and they're excited to hear the word of God. But the minute a confrontation comes up, or persecution because of the word, they're offended, and out the door they go. It's unbelievable how immature some can be, and Jesus describes them here. They have no root in themselves, and they fall away. Verse 18, And these are those who are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word, but the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of the riches, and the lusts of other things enter in, and choke out the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Again, Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You either serve the Lord or you serve riches. 
You cannot serve God and mammon. And so these as well, Jesus explains, fall away. But verse 20 says, these are those that are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. Praise God. You know, the Bible says, you have not chosen him, but he has chosen you and ordained you to go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit would remain, and that whatever you ask the Father in his name, he may give it to you. We have to bear fruit as Christians. And the Bible says in Proverbs 11 and verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. He that wins souls is wise. If you're a true believer, you'll have fruit in your life. Paul continues to encourage the people on the ship in spite of the impending danger as we go back to Acts chapter 27. We're going to read verses 32 through 36 now. The Bible says the soldiers cut off the ropes from the boat and let it fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul begged them all to take food, saying, This now is the fourteenth day that you've waited and continue fasting, and you've taken nothing to eat. Wherefore, I beg you now to take some food. This is for your health. There will not even a hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then they were all of good cheer, and they also took some food. So Paul again encouraging the people on the ship in spite of the impending danger. So let's take a look at John 14 and verse 27. John 14, fourth book in your New Testament, the book of John, 14th chapter, the 27th verse. Jesus said, Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. This year I turned 68 years old. In all my life I've never seen as much fear in this country as I do during the last several months. Fear abounds everywhere. It's unbelievable. The scripture tells us if we trust in the Lord, he hasn't given us a spirit of fear. He's given us power, love, and a sound mind. Let's take a look at Psalm 23. What are the benefits of being a believer in Christ? Well, first of all, no fear. There's plenty to be afraid of out there if you're in the flesh, but if you're in the spirit... You'll hear God's word. For the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That word want in the Hebrew means I shall not lack any good thing. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. God talks in that verse about provision and then peace. God provides all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And he also is the Prince of Peace. He's the only place we're going to have any peace in this world. Verse 3 says, He restores my soul. It takes the Lord to restore our wearied mind in troubled times like these. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, that's true. In, in Isaiah 48, 11, the Bible says, I do these things for my own name's sake. Why should my name be polluted? I will not give my glory to another. God leads us in righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. How much is no evil? That's all evil. I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What does it mean, God's rod and God's staff? God's protection is his rod. A rod was used by a shepherd to beat away bears and lions, keep them away from the sheep. But the staff was to pull the sheep closer. So God pulls us closer with the staff, and with the rod, he protects us. Hallelujah. 
In verse 37, back in Acts chapter 27, verse 37, the Bible says, And we were in all the ship, there were two hundred, three score, and sixteen souls. Well, a score is twenty, so that's two hundred and sixty plus sixteen. Two hundred and seventy-six people on this ship being tossed about for fourteen days and nearly starving. So here they are. You know, the Lord has Paul list the exact number of souls on board. 276. Why? Well, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 26. The Bible says, Behold, the fowls of the air, they do not sow, neither do they reap, nor do they gather into barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? I think the message there is, if God feeds birds, which we see hundreds every day, aren't you more important than birds? I believe God listed the exact number of people on the ship because he wants people to know he cares about each and every one of us. The scripture tells us to cast all of our care upon the Lord, for he cares for us. Then let's take a look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 after the book of James in your New Testament. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Bible says that God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering or patient towards us, not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I want to talk about that just for a minute. It's not the Lord's will for anyone to perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Won't you put your faith in Christ today? There are some who no doubt will hear this message that aren't born again. The Bible says if we believe that Jesus is the Lord, and if we believe that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. Because it's with our heart, with our heart we believe into righteousness, and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We can call upon the name of the Lord, repent, turn away from our wickedness, turn unto God, confess our sins to Him, tell Him that we believe that He's the Lord and that He rose from the dead, and ask Him to come into our lives. The word believe means to totally, completely rely upon. It's not a religious work. It's a faith work. It's, a, it's the faith that God gave us when we were first born. Like uh, Romans 12.3 says, that no man ought to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but he ought to think soberly according to the measure of faith which God had dealt to every man. So God gives us all faith. The Bible says in Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. And there's no voice or language where their speech is not heard. Romans chapter 1 tells us that even the creation shows the Godhead, or the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that no one has any excuse at all. God has spoken to us. Do we believe? Will we trust him? John chapter 17 is the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. So if you'll turn with me to John the 17th chapter, and starting with verse 9, Jesus prays for us in the garden as he's about ready to go and be crucified. What compassion and love our God has for us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus cries out, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for those which you have given me, Father, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. So keep through your own name those whom you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. 
Those that you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost, except the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, speaking of Judas Iscariot, who denied and betrayed Christ. And then in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30, Jesus gives us a promise in his own words. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. For my Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. For I and my Father are one. Oh, what a great promise. No one can pluck us out of the hand of the Lord. Jesus put it this way. Do not fear those who can kill the body, but rather fear him who can kill the body and then afterwards kill the soul in hell. That's who you should fear. Not the ones who can kill the body and afterwards they can do nothing. But fear him. Fear the living God. He is a consuming fire. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Won't you come to him if you don't know him? Call upon his name today. As we close, I'd like to read in Acts chapter 27, verses 38 through 44 to finish out this chapter. The Bible says, When they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. When it was day, they did not see the land, but they discovered a certain creek with the shore, into which they were minded, if it were possible, to put the ship in there. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves to the sea, and they loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail towards the wind and made towards the shore. And falling into a place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the back part of the ship was broken up because of the violence of the waves. Just like the angel told the Apostle Paul, you're going to lose the ship, but there'll be no one lost. Verse 42 says the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners. Still they didn't believe. Even though they've seen all these signs that the Apostle Paul said... The soldiers counseled to kill the prisoners, lest any of them would swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they could swim and cast themselves into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some went on board, some on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they all escaped safely to land. The word of God that was given to Paul actually comes to pass. God has given us plenty of words to encourage us. We're in a shipwreck, I believe, in this nation. But God promised that he would save us to the uttermost. He tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the Lord will come from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We have hope in Christ. He is our blessed hope. The Bible says in Luke 21 and verse 36, Pray ye always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We have hope in Christ. Hallelujah. In his resurrection, we will be resurrected from this earth. Praise God. The word that God gave to Paul comes to pass just the way he spoke it. And the word God gave to us will come to pass just the way he spoke it. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians. It's to the right of the book of Acts, past the book of Romans and 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. The Bible says, all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him are amen unto the glory of God by us. All the promises, all the promises of God. Romans, if you'll turn back to your left, chapter 15, verse 5, tells us this. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God 
even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of this, receive one another, as God also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises that have been made to the fathers. Christ confirms every word. Hallelujah. And then Numbers 23, 19, as we close, the scripture says, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the Son of Man, or the Son of God, that he should repent or turn around from what he said. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall it not come to pass? The Bible says in John 17, 17, Father, this is Jesus' prayer, sanctify or set them apart through your truth. Thy word is truth. You can bank on it. God's word is true. Praise God for his saving grace. And praise the Lord for this lesson today to see how God saved the Apostle Paul and 175 other prisoners from certain destruction. God is able. He is the God of heaven and earth. There's nothing too difficult for him. Let's close in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for your grace and your goodness, your mercy, your provision. And Lord, thank you for saving us from the trouble that we see upon this earth. We know that soon and very soon we're going to see our King. We thank you for your promises in 1 Corinthians 15 where you tell us that you will show us a mystery. We will not all sleep but we're all going to be changed. For in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. Your word tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We rejoice in that, Father. Help us to work while we're yet having a day to work with. And Lord, we know that a night is coming when no man can work any longer. Help those who hear this message who may not be believers to receive you as Lord and Savior. And I pray, Father God, that you would be glorified through all. Bless your people, I pray, and bless this message. I ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you for joining us, and God bless you.